All right. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, in a short while, I will be joined by Tor Venislan, who you well know is the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East peace process. Um, in the meantime, just a couple of things I want to flag to you. This morning, the Secretary General in the General Assembly Hall outlined his priorities for 2024. One of his main priorities is to be here tomorrow, 12.30 p.m., for a press conference to answer your questions, and I can tell you he's very much looking forward to that. Um, in his remarks uh, this morning to the delegates, he covered topics from peace to war to climate and technology. The Secretary General's underlying message that peace is the raison d'etre of this organization. He lamented that his vision of this world is that the one thing missing most dramatically is peace in all its dimensions, and that as conflicts rage and geopolitical divisions grow, peace in our world is threatened and polarization deepens as human rights are trampled, peace within communities is undermined, and our world has entered a, quote, age of chaos, he said. Um, the Secretary General also spoke about the situation in the Middle East and reiterated his call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire and the release of all hostages being held in Gaza. Also called, reiterated his call for a just and sustainable peace in Ukraine in line with the UN Charter and uh, international law. And also spoke about the Sahel where terrorism is spiking and civilians are continuing to pay a terrible price. Um, he, the Secretary General also underscored that the multinational security support mission in Haiti must be deployed without delay and urged member states to provide the necessary financial support. The Secretary General concluded by saying that peace can be achieved, can achieve wonders, that wars never will, and that while war destroys, peace builds. But in today's troubled world, he said building peace is a conscious, bold, and even radical act, noting that it is humanity's greatest responsibility individually and collectively to build peace. Um, the Secretary General said that for his part, uh, he will never give up pushing for peace. His remarks were shared with you. Uh, little updates from Gaza for you, uh, Jamie McGoldrick, uh, the humanitarian coordinator for the Middle East, for um, the occupied Palestinian uh, territory was uh, was in uh, Gaza uh, t today, and uh, also in Gaza today was Sigrid uh, Kog, uh, our senior humanitarian coordinator, uh, as recently named. Uh, they uh, she Miss Kog also met with the head of the Egyptian Red Crescent Society in uh, Rafa, and Mr. McGoldrick visited a number of um, humanitarian operations, including a water des desalination plant uh, in South Gaza, where he saw how par spare parts and construction materials are sorely needed to uh, swiftly repair these critical in pieces of infrastructure. And uh, as you know, it has now been four months since the escalation of hostilities, and our colleagues at OCHA are warning that severe food shortages, a breakdown in health services, and inadequate facilities for water, sanitation, and hygiene are putting children under the age of five, as well as pregnant and bre breastfeeding women, at increased risk of malnutrition. A new screening by our humanitarian partners indicates that a sharp rise in acute, acute malnutrition uh, with a 12-fold inc increase compared to the rate of rec uh, recorded before the hostilities. These initial findings uh, suggest that without adequate me. care and preventive uh, services, the situation will only worsen. Last week, our humanitarian partners distributed supplementary nutrition assistance to nearly 42,000 children under the age of five and almost 4,000 pregnant and breastfeeding women. Turning to Ukraine, uh, Denise Brown, our humanitarian coordinator in Ukraine, denounced a new wave of attacks on Ukrainian cities and towns that took place overnight and this morning. As reported to us by national authorities, the attacks caused scores of civilian casualties in six regions of Ukraine and massively disrupted essential services at the height of winter, including uh, civilian, excuse me, including uh, electricity, water, and gas supplies, especially in Mykolaiv city and Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. Ms. Brown said that humanitarian workers mobilized an emergency response in Kyiv and Mykolaiv, delivering food, water, warm clothing, repair materials, and psychosocial assistance. They also registered uh, people impacted by the attacks for cash assistance. 
Humanitarian workers also provided support to people after recent attacks in the Kharkiv region, including in uh, Veliki Burluk town, which had suffered multiple aerial attacks yesterday, damaging a hospital. Ms. Brown repeated that attacks in Ukraine, which are killing and injuring civilians and damaging civilian infrastructure, are deeply concerning, and civilians must be spared from the violence. And yesterday afternoon, also in Ukraine, Rosemary DiCarlo, the Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, briefed Security Council members, uh, noting that the number of civilian casualties in Ukraine significantly increased in December and January compared with previous month, reversing a trend of decreasing civilian casualties throughout 2023, adding that as the humanitarian situation continues to deteriorate, we are increasingly concerned about the safety and security of humanitarian aid workers. Um, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, the Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, wrapped up a visit to the Democratic Republic of the Congo with a renewed call on the M23 armed group to immediately cease its offensive on the country's east and to respect the Luanda roadmap. He expressed his solidarity with the impacted population and reiterated the commitment of the UN mission to implement its mandate and protect civilians. In Kinshasa yesterday, he met with President Tshisekedi. They discussed reinforcements of the presence and uh, capacity of Congolese defense and security forces in Itori, North Kivu, and South Kivu. As we mentioned before, UN peacekeepers are due to exit from these three provinces as part of the mission, mission's disengagement plan from the DRC. Um, also, staying in the DRC, um, our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that they're deeply worried and concerned about the escalating humanitarian crisis in the DRC, particularly in the Maisisi territory, North Kivu. Fighting between the Congolese army and the M23 armed group has displaced at least 130,000 people in different areas of the Maisisi territory in the past two weeks. This is adding to an already dire situation in North Kivu. People who've been displaced, including 26,000 men, women, and children now in the town of Sake in North Kivu, and 24,000 people in the town of Minova in South Kivu have limited access to food, clean water, health care, and shelter. Uh, the clashes have also impacted the road map, the road, excuse me, between Sake and where where Mana, Mama, Mana, which is a major route connecting the provinces of North and South Kivu. This risks isolating Goma, um, which is a city of two million people, which also hosts about 500,000 displaced men, women, and children. It could jeopardize food security and economic activity in Goma and the area. The growing insecurity in Masisi is preventing some, preventing some 630,000 people who were previously displaced from accessing crucial medical care, including medical assistance for those who've been injured in the ongoing conflict. Uh, the risks of further violence, including in Goma, remains high. We continue to implore for unhindered humanitarian access to all who need it. Uh, we also urge all the parties to the conflict to respect international humanitarian law and take concrete actions to protect civilians. Uh, over the past few days, uh, we have been, uh, in the weeks, um, we've been updating you on the dire humanitarian situation in Sudan. And today, uh, we and our partners appealed uh, for $2.7 billion and an event in Geneva to meet the most urgent needs of civilians in Sudan and another $1.4 billion to support uh, 2.7 million people who are living in five countries uh, outside of Sudan who've been pushed out by conflict. The $4.1 billion combined appeal is a stark reminder that half of Sudan's population um, needs humanitarian assistance and protection. Intense hostilities continue to damage critical civilian infrastructure, and nearly three quarters of health facilities are out of service in states impacted by the hostilities, while diseases include cholera, measles, and malaria are spreading. From Geneva, Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffith stressed that last year's appeal was less than half funded and that there's a need to do better this year. And for his part, the High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grande, who had recently met with uh, displaced families in Sudan and um, 
uh, inside Sudan and refugees in Ethiopia said the message he got from them is that they wanted peace so they're able to go back home and rebuild their lives. We urge generous donors to listen to these voices and to contribute and help people in Sudan who are in need. Um, speaking of need, the UN, the World Food Program today welcomed a contribution of $3.8 million from the UN Central Emergency Response Fund to support Afghans who've been forced to leave Pakistan and return to Afghanistan. The funding will allow WFP to provide cash assistance to nearly 33,000 families. This is more than 230,000 children, uh, men, women, and uh, men, women, and children, including persons with disabilities who have returned uh, to Afghanistan. WFP says these families are arriving at the world's worst times of the year in winter when hunger bites hardest in Afghanistan and humanitarian funding is at a low point. Uh, because of funding shortages, WFP um, was forced to reduce ra ration sizes and scale back on life-saving food assistance, which impacts 10 million people. And in, Un in, Un excuse me, in Myanmar, our colleagues at UNICEF say they are appalled by the deaths of four school children and uh, two teachers as a result of an airstrike on two schools in Kaya State, and that took place on Monday. Uh, UNICEF and, of course, we joined their strong condemnation of any strikes against schools and places of learning. Uh, attacks against schools are grave violations of children's rights and international humanitarian law. The ages of the children who were killed was between 12 and 14 years old. And uh, turning to Chile, the Secretary General is deeply saddened by the tragic death of former President of Chile, Sebastian Piñera. He will be remembered for his long public service and his strong commitment to democracy in Chile. He calls his calls for climate action resonated at the General Assembly, the United Nations, and globally. The Secretary General expresses his heartfelt condolences to the families of President Piñera and to the people and government of Chile. Uh, senior personnel appointment. Um, the UN Development Coordination Office tells us that we have a new resident coordinator in Yemen. The Secretary General appointed Julian Harnais following confirmation by the host government. He took up his post this week and will serve as the humanitarian coordinator in the country with more than 30 years of experience in development coordination, humanitarian assistance and management. Mr. Harnais will lead the work of our UN team on the ground to boost Yemen's commitment to advance the SDGs and leave no one behind. His full bio is available to you. Lastly, we have a little quiz for you. Uh, no bad puns or quirky factoids. Uh, it's not really funny for us. Um, how many member states have paid their dues? 43. Exactly. And that's, um, that's the last receipt to date uh, that would qualify them to a uh, place on the honor roll. They have until the end of day tomorrow to send in their checks or suitcases full of cash. We will take cash. Um, no pressure, but we're of course happy to we'll be report, continuing to report on those who pay in full in total recognition that every country has different payment and budgeting cycles, not to mention different national dishes, different national drinks, and different mountain ranges. James. So can I um, follow up on Gaza and on the Secretary General's comments about the Israeli military intending to focus on Rafa. Could you perhaps expand on the UN's worries given that Rafa is one of the main crossing points and the fact it's the place that so many people have fled to? Well, I, I think our, our worry are <laughs> exemplified in your question. Uh, since the beginning of this conflict, uh, civilians in Gaza have been told for their own safety to move south progressively. And now they're in a last little corner, which in itself is not that safe, because no place is safe in Gaza. But if, if the fighting that we've seen in the north and in the center of Gaza would move to Rafah, the consequences would be catastrophic and almost too catastrophic to imagine. Okay. Um, reports, um, as you're aware, there's negotiations going on and the U.S. Secretary of State is in the region now. Uh, reports that the Israeli Defense Minister um, has said that they do not like the Hamas response, they call it negative, that they've given to the, the, the negotiations that are ongoing and the latest Hamas offer. And that's why they're about to launch the Rafah um, the, the offensive. 
I mean, they have throughout this talked about self-defence. Now it seems that they are responding simply because they don't like what Hamas is offering in part of a negotiation. The UN's Look, I, response I, I, to that. I don't, uh, I, I can't speak for people's reasoning or, or why they're, do, what, what, uh, why they're pursuing certain actions. There are a lot of intense negotiations that we're aware of regarding uh, the release of hostages, regarding cessation in, in fighting. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes and there's a lot of rhetoric publicly and I'm not going to add to that rhetoric. One final one if I can on the same general subject. Um, a letter has been written, I don't know whether you've seen it, a letter to the Secretary General by 16 Palestinian human rights organizations expressing their disappointment and calling for an inquiry into the special advisor for the prevention of genocide, Alice Wairumu Enderitu, um, and her absence and her fa uh, wanting an inquiry in her for failure to uh, fulfill her duties, um, saying the absence is particularly glaring given the ICJ's acknowledgement of the plausibility of genocide committed by Israel. So can you respond, where is the special advisor on the prevention of genocide. Why is she making no comment she, whatsoever? She has, and uh, and uh, what uh, is the uh, Secretary uh, General's first, response to this the, letter? The, I haven't seen the letter. The letter will be responded to. Uh, she continues to serve with the full uh, backing and confidence of the Secretary General. She is pursuing uh, her work and she will report back uh, in due time um, uh, to the Security Council or to her, annu her, her annual report. She only reports uh, she, in her annual she report. Has, She's supposed she to has, early she, warning of genocide has, is supposed she to be has, one of her she roles. She has issued uh, statements. Edie. Thank you, Steph. On uh, two other issues, uh, does the Secretary General have any comments ahead of Pakistan's uh, parliamentary elections tomorrow and the ex deadly explosions in Balochistan uh, today on the eve of voting? Well, I can tell you uh, that we strongly condemn uh, the horrific uh, ex attacks and the bomb explosions uh, that we saw earlier today that killed many, many people uh, and injured many more uh, a day before the elections, clearly related uh, to the elections. I think for us, uh, for the Secretary General, he wants to emphasize the right of Pakistanis uh, to participate in elections that is free from from fear, from intimidation, and frankly from uh, uh, from violence. He of course extends his deepest condolences to the victims, uh, their families, and wishes a prompt recovery uh, to those who were injured. And uh, the United Nations will continue to stand in solidarity with the government of people in Pakistan in their efforts to address extremism and terrorism. On. A subject you raised, um, the um, peacekeeping chief's visit mm -hmm. to the DRC, to Congo. Um, you didn't mention uh, one thing that apparently is a major concern in eastern Congo, that um, hundreds of people are fleeing uh, Goma, the main city there, because they fear an M23 takeover the, by that rebel group. I, I mean, I, I think I did mention it. I mentioned in our my humanitarian update uh, on the risks that Goma is uh, is facing. You know, a city of two million people, half a million uh, internally displaced people, with fighting uh, continuing, especially on the road. Uh, that uh, links South Kivu to North Kivu. Um, so I think I, I did highlight a lot of those concerns. Up to some. Um, a follow up on the issue of the letter, uh, b because you, you are saying that there, there is her annual, uh, annual report, but as a matter of fact, she did issue other statements on other subjects, but not on that subject. And there is another issue in that letter that the Palestinian NGOs, uh, human rights NGOs said, that she's even refusing to meet with them 
and the representative of them. There was a meeting that was supposed to take place. She canceled. Her office is not answering uh, okay. their I, emails. I, I don't, so there is a systematic I don't have, uh, problem I, here. I, I don't have visibility on her on her schedule. We can uh, get some details. Uh, get some details on, on, on that front. But, but do you see that there is an, a, a systematic issue that's happening, and uh, despite the fact that almost 100,000 Palestinians in Gaza within three months or four months, between injured, killed, or um, uh, under the rubbles, and there is nothing that coming from her office. Do you see that why people are having a Look, lot of I, questions I think in I this can, regard? Uh, I don't uh, discount uh, people's anger, right, and, and frustration. I can tell you that the UN system, I think, has been, and the Secretary General has been, uh, has been very vocal. People criticize the Secretary General. They criticize all the other senior UN officials. That is their uh, that is their right, uh, Benno. Thanks, Steph. Um, just the daily questions. I think in the last twenty four hours, did you receive uh, final report this year from the Israeli government regarding? Uh, as far as UNRWA is concerned, uh, not that I'm aware. As it part of your my daily answer to your daily question is that OIOS is doing its investigation. I have no visibility, nor should I have any visibility in terms of what they're doing and who they're speaking with and the information they're getting. Do you think the level of cooperation with the Israeli government is sufficient at this point? I can't speak to the contest between OIOS and the Israeli uh, government because I'm not, a, I'm, as I said, this is independent. I have no visibility on, on that. Mike, then Abdel Hamid. A couple questions, Steph. Uh, just following up on an inquiry I sent previously, uh, the review group that was announced on Monday for UNRWA, there was one of the research organizations involved, CMI, out of Norway. They produced a report, a detailed report on UNRWA back in 2022. They found in that report that skepticism of outright opposition to UNRWA is based on misunderstandings or unfounded claims. They claim that UNRWA has zero tolerance for incitement, but this can be hard to control. They said that criticisms of the curriculum in UNRWA schools amount to political right. attacks that serve to delegitimize the agency. But so what is, what is the, the question? The question is, why, why is this organization that made up their minds about UNRWA two years ago involved I, in this? Listen, I, I think uh, you and, and others, uh, and I've gotten other questions in that same, uh, same vein. Uh, what I would ask uh, is that people withhold judgment on the quality of the work of this independent review group. Uh, until they come out uh, with their report, uh, and as we've said, the final report will be made uh, will be made public. Um, you know, a lot of people have said a lot of things on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, since the beginning of the conflict, right? So th there's one can always find comments that don't that people find. Uh, don't agree with their line line of thinking. What I'm saying here is that we have three research institutions. We have a former French uh, uh, foreign minister. It's, let's it's wait. Let, but let's let's wait. A, let's a, wait. A, let's wait until. It's a forty-page uh, report. Uh, that I, I understand, but let's questions. but let's let's wait uh, until uh, they've concluded their work. Second question for yes, you. Yes, sir. Uh, tragically, over 100 UNRWA workers died in the first month of hostilities. According to UN figures, there's been 50 additional deaths over the last three months. Have there been any additional protections given to UNRWA workers since that initial mark of, of 100 plus that has allowed that death toll to at least percentage-wise drop over the last three months? Have there been any changes that you can attribute that that drop in, in, in percentages of deaths to over I, the last I three mean, months? I mean, you know, UN, UNRWA, uh, the UNRWA staff, uh, and especially the Palestinian UNRWA staff uh, has the same, carries the same, face the same risks as Palestinian civilians uh, because they are Palestinian civilians uh, who live who live in Gaza. There's no special measures that we can take to uh, to protect them as they go about their daily lives, as they they go be with their families and and live where they live. Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. You just said that uh, Ms. Uh, Alison Redito issued the statement. 
She issued one statement on 7th of Oct about 7 October, and after raising her status and her behavior, that statement was pulled out from that website of the special advisor on genocide. It's not, it's not there. It's not there. But she issued, uh, issued uh, many other statements on different. I mean, you just said she issued a statement. I didn't see any regarding what happened between October 7 until now. None. Zero. Is, I don't, I mean, I, with all due respect, I mean, there's no question mark in your statement. No, you, you just said. I, I, you just I'm just said saying, I'm saying what I've said about her, that she continues to work with the full confidence of the you Secretary said she General. The statement. I, uh, yeah. With the full confidence of the Secretary General. Okay. My second question. Yes, sir. If you have the patience. I, oh, if one thing I have, <laughs> Thank you, you. You, you have a, uh, not to paraphrase Mark Twain, but I know you have a bottomless supply of ink, and I have a bottomless supply of patience. Thank you. On UNRWA, yes, sir. first UNRWA issued a statement saying that it will run out of funds mm -hmm. by the end of February, if you have any update uh, on that. There's, there's been no uh, magic gift of cash to UNRWA since we've okay. made that statement. And on the inquiry, so the Secretary General and Lazzarini found it so urgent to investigate the news coming only from Israel about, it's, it's, they first said 12, now 6. But why it's not urgent to investigate killing 152 staff and destroying over 160 facilities? Because it is, it, is not, it is not for lack of will. It is an, almost an impossible task to do that while a conflict is going on. It does not mean that it will not be done. Uh, Yvonne. Thank you. My question is on Haiti again. Um, the Secretary General said today in his remarks that he urged all obstacles to be removed for the deployment of the multinational force. What, what did he mean by all obstacles? Well, if there were no obstacles, one would assume it would have been deployed much quicker than the process that is, uh, that, that is going on. Uh, we also understand that several governments are planning to announce contributions uh, to the uh, uh, to the fund um, it's it's a challenging task uh, it's a challenging task on the ground in Haiti obviously we see what I mean I read the, the press like you do there are a number of members some member state is having challenges uh, internally we hope that um, everyone who can contribute to the force either in, in, in uh, with 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 people and, and, and equipment or funds will do so as quickly as possible. Uh, I will get to you in a second. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to ask about DPRK and uh, Russia. And uh, uh, there was a report yesterday that uh, Russia is allowing North Korea to use uh, Russian bank accounts and uh, releasing frozen assets. Uh, that would be related to transfer of North Korean weapons to Russia, uh, which is, uh, which could be a violation of the Security Council resolution. So, any comment uh, from? I, I I have not seen those press reports. Let me look into it, and I'll get back to you, uh, Ephraim. Just a quick follow-up on Ms. Inderito's um, question. I don't think it's about people's anger or whether or not the Secretary General can be criticized. It's just the issue of genocide. Yeah. It's on everyone's tongue. The human rights lawyers, international lawyers, the UN itself is saying 2.2 million people are hungry, infrastructure is destroyed, 100,000 people between dead and under the rubble. And the question is, the most important office to judge on this one, Office of the Prevention of Genocide, has been silent. And how is that acceptable? I hear your question. I really can only refer you to what I've already said. Um, Stefano, then we'll go to the screen, and I think we do need to go to our guests. Um, yes, uh, two questions. One is uh, about UNRWA. It did um, um, one European, can many European countries, uh -huh. other countries, cut uh, funds to UNRWA. Did the Secretary General reach those countries to explain uh, what he thought about it, and, well, he, and to try to prevent. He, he had. He had. Uh, yeah, understand that he did this. He had an extensive meeting for more than two hours with all the major donors and answered yeah, all their but I, questions. Yes, but what I 
what I'm saying is because he is, we're talking about if there are without the proofs, without the document to show this. Did he after? Did he try after? Did he find out something that will prevent this country? That well, I think to the decisions. But if you look at the timeline, the decisions by a lot of donors were taken uh, extremely uh, quickly. As the secretary, I think, told him, he un he understands that they are each donor operates within a certain political uh, context, but his appeal was uh, to avoid um, further harm and, and suffering to the civilians in, in Gaza. And second question is about uh, tomorrow there is a Security Council uh, meeting on uh, tension between Serbia mm -hmm. and Kosovo, and there is the President of Serbia coming, Vucic. Uh, does the Secretary General has a plan to meet him? And uh, what does he think about uh, the fact that there is this meeting? I mean, with all the things going on, does he think that this, the, that the tension that there is in this moment there is worth a security council, or is, uh, he would prefer that this would be resolved in Europe uh, at the moment? He, listen, it's not for the, the, the sec, it's not for the Secretary General to say whether it's a good idea or for the bad idea for, uh, the Security Council to meet on, on an issue that's on its agenda. That's the role of the Security Council. All I can tell you is that uh, Caroline Ziade, the um, special representative, will brief in an open meeting uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. And obviously we'll, uh, you could see what she has to say on behalf of the Secretariat. Uh, let's go to Maggie, then Pam, and Iftikhar. Hi, the upcoming meeting in Doha on the 18th that the Secretary General is convening on Afghan with the, his with the various Afghanistan envoys, uh, the Taliban is reported to be opposing the appointment of an additional UN envoy, saying SRSG Otumbayeva is enough. Uh, do you have a response to that? And if they refuse to cooperate with a new envoy, how does the Secretary General envision their being able to deliver on their mandate? I mean, Thanks. I think it's it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of hypotheticals. Uh, no new uh, envoy has been uh, has been announced. Uh, the secretary general will be in Doha in uh, in February for the meeting of special envoys on Afghanistan. These are national envoy. Of course, his special representative uh, will be there. Uh, but I don't want to prejudge any decision uh, that the secretary general may decide to to take. Uh, Pamela. Hi, Steph. Oh, wait, Steph, sorry, just one follow-up, sorry. Um, will he announce his new UN Special Envoy at that meeting or w before the meeting? I, What's, I don't, I, I think I, I really don't want to pre, uh, prejudge what decision the Secretary General may make or take. Uh, Mar uh, Pamela. Yes, thanks, Steph. Um, I just would like you to um, elaborate a little on the IOI uh, OIOS investigation into UNRWA. A few more. Can you give a little more granularity? Uh, Fatima, uh, sorry, Fatumata and Dai and Ben Swanson are sort of the heads of I OIOS. Is that, can you tell us who will be doing it? Will it come out as a GA information? Will you report back? And is there any updated timetable? Thanks. Uh, no, no, and no. Um, <laughs> no granularity. No, so I no gran. I love, I love granular. I mean, granularity is my favorite word. Uh, but uh, the short answer is that oh, I, I do not get into iOS's business. They don't. Well, everybody gets into mine. They, I don't get into their business. Uh, they're doing what they need to do. Uh, what information they will do it as quickly and as efficiently as they can. What information can be shared, uh, we will see. Obviously, we will have to respect uh, certain issues of confidentiality and privacy, but we will try to be as transparent as possible. If Dekar, but Will you be able to tell us at some point who conducted the investigation? No, I will not give you the name of the investigators. Um, okay, thank you. You're welcome. If Dekar, uh, Thank you, Steph. Uh, Edi has already asked the question I wanted to ask about uh, the explosion in Pakistan and the election. I just want to know whether the United Nations is sending any observers to monitor the election? 
uh, we do not uh, send observers unless there's very specific mandate uh, mandate to do so. I can check with our country office if we're offering any technical uh, support. Uh, Thank you. You're most welcome. James, Benno, and then I'll cut it off and we'll go get our guest. Just going back to the special advisor on genocide, who the Secretary General has full confidence in, does he still have full confidence in the special representative for children and armed conflict? When did he last speak to these two ladies? Um, and is he aware of what they're actually doing? Because we're not. Yes. Uh, Ms. Uh, Gamba is continuing to work on her annual report, which is presented in, uh, in the spring. Uh, you may not be aware, but she, the, that office has produced a number of other reports because they're looking at many different places, reports from other places in the, in, in the world, and they're continuing, uh, they're continuing their work. Uh, Benno. I try my luck with the climate crisis question. The Super Bowl is coming up, and I read today that 1,000 private jets are expected in Las Vegas. Do you have any message to all the people who can't be bothered I to think, fly commercial I, I to Las Vegas? I think if they had um, if they had coordinated their travel, they probably have could have saved on a number of planes, and maybe chartered a few big planes instead of a lot of small planes. Uh, I was going to try to mention Taylor Swift, but I won't. Uh, I want to ask you about that. On, the, on, on that, on mentioning Taylor Swift, I will go get the special uh, coordinator. 